one. Welcome to the Sultans of Spine. I'm your host, Jamil. And on this podcast, what we're trying to do is take a look inside the spine and robotics industry and other industries of med device. Our goal is to show you just a little peek under the hood of, of, of what we're doing, what we're working on, and get you excited about this industry, which is growing at a rapid pace. And you know what I'm so excited about this morning for my guest, Tobias, is to hear from him on, on what he does to stay, to, to stay successful, on where he sees this industry going, and just have a conversation because Toby and I are friends. So this is fun. This is really fun for me. And Toby, thank you so much for joining. Uh, why don't you just introduce yourself and, and let the audience know a little bit more about you. Uh, named Tobias Hernandez, based out of Chicago. That's where my heart and soul are. Uh, I'm oldest of four kids. This is not where I'd be if you asked me when I'm 21, graduating from college. Hey, like, what do you do? The idea of a, of a salesman comes off as, I don't know, like I'm selling t-shirts out of the back of my or something, something random. Like, that's what I thought of sales. I didn't realize that was a level of professionalism behind sales. So I, I never thought that I wanted to be an attorney. And I was getting, really? yeah, wanted to take my, my LSATs um, in college. And then I did an internship and it was such a terrible experience. <laughs> to the idea. I never knew that about you, man. That's awesome. Well, see, so let me, I take, I know you're from Chicago, born and raised in Chicago, but you moved somewhere, somewhere really interesting and somewhere really cool. You might, where, where, where are you based? Where are you today? So I currently live in Austin, Texas. You know, it's uh, yeah, buddy. been it weird, man. That's why the long hair works. <laughs> UT stuff. I love it. Well, we love to have you. A lot of people are moving to Texas and I'm really glad that you moved to Texas because our friendship and, and just our, our working relationship has blossomed. And so what's fun for me is it's just we work together at Nuvasive. We uh, but we didn't really get to do a lot of things together. We I think if we've talked about this before. We've shared uh, trays, right, like corpectomy cages and different things. We would ship back and forth. And and honestly, when you were interviewing with Medtronic, that was one thing that I could say is that I trust this guy. Because he would always treat my consigned sets like his own. It, 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 and that said to me that, that, that you're someone with high integrity that understands that, you know, replenishments and all those things matter. Like, don't, don't strip my tray with something that you might need for your surgeon because that's just not what you do. And it's interesting to see now, I don't know, it's a small thing, but I remember that about you. Well, the funny part about that is it's, I, why would I do that to somebody that helped me? And I get it. When, you're want, when you want your territory to blossom, unfortunately, everybody will do anything. Mm -hmm. It stays that way. And then you become a more tenured rep. And what you're looking for is a little, let's call it the work-life balance. To me, right. it doesn't make sense. But this job doesn't have balance. It's a complete imbalance of your whole life. So why would I do something like that you could, you just save me. My job is to take this stress on as opposed to pass it on to somebody else. And who would have thought that, you know, almost eight years later, I would have to call you and say, I'm moving to, to Dallas. You know, I fell in love, all that stuff. Right. Imagine if you remembered me as like the guy that stole your stuff. Yeah, man. I mean, honestly, like that's the little stuff that matters. Like I just had this call with a, with a gal who, who graduated with her master's in, in, the, in the neurosciences. And I'm talking to her about like, you know, what she needs to focus on. And for any of you people that are trying to break into med sales or for any of you younger folks, it's the little things. So your school, your grades, all that stuff is, is kind of gets you in the door. It's just expected. Uh, uh, but, but, but I would say highlight the fact that you're doing things to volunteer. She was a yoga instructor, right? All these things, like that's what's interesting to people. And she gets up every morning and teaches yoga. So what does that say to me, Toby? That says that she's not going to have any problem waking up early to, to, to be in a case. 
She's someone that is uh, centered, that is a leader. She's teaching others. She's growing, right? Those are little things. And one of the next, one of the episodes on this show on Sultans of Spine, I'm so excited to, uh, to show Melanie was my wife and I's Orange Theory coach. And I recognized she had talent. She was making everybody laugh in the room. And now she's in med device and, and she got promoted like six or eight months in. It's just fun to see, like you, you can see people that can do this and it's hard to really put pinpoint what translates into success. Would you agree? 100%. You, there's a lot of skills that you learn that in your head, they're the soft skills. And, you know, let's use some of the corporate lingo. I don't really like using those words, but so that people can understand where I'm coming from. It is how you treat others. If you're there to help, if, if you're at a social function, are you helping people move chairs around? That's what you would be doing in the OR. Are you helping the, the circulator move the trash can out of the way so that she can mm -hmm. where it needs to be? Are you getting trays ready? Are you looking for the backup plan? It is the same idea, just the settings different, but the work remains the same. We didn't change anything. We just paid attention. Well said. God, that's great. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's all the little things. It's how you handle yourself. It's how you communicate with others. It's how you treat others. And in an interview process that, you know, I was a, I was a hiring manager and now I, I, I'm, a, I'm an influencer, right? I, I see a lot of these resumes and I work with the hiring managers. So I get to see a lot of how people are displaying themselves. And that's the only way. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see how they're managing that, right? How they put their resume together or how they're communicating when they do communicate. And just the same ways that you would expect to, or we, we are looking for clues. We are looking for things that are going to say, this person's successful. And so let's talk about what you do today, because look, I'm glad to get time with you because you're a busy guy. You're jet set and you're all over the place. We were just in Miami together and you're traveling around different ORs in your region. And so what have you learned from that experience? And, and I've got a follow-up question about, uh, about relationships, but just in general, like this sales role that you're expanding markets and growing through disruptive technology, like Mazor on your, on your scrubs there, what, 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 have you, what have you learned? Having to connect with people that are way smarter than you, that can call you a name that you don't wanna hear in front of people you've never met before, is really daunting. Um, like I have, you and I did this job and now I have to travel to a different city, a different state and just meet somebody that's brand new, put this pressure on you and saying, hey doc, this is Toby the expert for lateral. He's gonna walk you through the process. I have never met him. Outside of my own little research, I have no idea. Like I, I know where he went to school. Maybe I'll ask some questions. Is he a nice guy? Is she, is she really just by the book? Does she like to joke around? Those are the little things that I want to get to know before I walk in because mm -hmm. just cracking a joke. And I got this advice from, um, it's actually, I believe the Dalai Lama said it in the book of joy. Like he would meet heads of state and then he would try to fart on purpose. <laughs> just, oh my gosh, I love it. Just, just so that he can break the ice. Like it's not this serious guys. Like don't, don't get so uptight about what we're doing here. So I would try to come up with a joke or just like hand, do a weird handshake, just anything just to break the ice. So, right. you, hey, we're still human. Yes, this is a big deal, but there's no need to panic. And then connecting with them, joking, like paying attention if they have a shirt from a cycling company or anything, like any little thing, just so that you can create that connection. Just common ground. I talk about this a lot. You just need to find common ground. And what's, what's really interesting about this, Toby, you and I were reps in the room for a long time. Did, did, it, did it well, did it successfully. And I think the reason for that, one reason for that is the ability to create relationships, right? And when you're a sales rep in the room or an interoperative consultant in the room, you have the gift of time. You have the gift of consistency. They see you multiple times, multiple days, doing all the legwork, right? The hustle. That helps, I think, build your brand and your character inside the walls of that OR, right? Because they see all the things that you do. I mean, I developed relationships with the SPD, the janitor, anybody, anybody, because, you know, you know me, man, I'm, I'm not, I've never met a stranger, right? Yes. How have you been able to create relationships 
in this place where sometimes you're a guest, sometimes you're a stranger, as you're entering in these operating rooms from you know all over the all over the nation, what 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 is maybe a couple of things you've learned or when you reflect back on doing this job, like what when do you want to share? When I first get into a new OR, I you, you have to act very humble and acting sounds like I'm trying to be sneaky, and that's not it. Right. You walking, being humble and confident at the same time. You have to have presence, but be easily forgotten, which is not that easy to do. So you have to walk into an OR and look for the OR director, look for the charge nurse and speak softly. Hey, my name is Toby. I'm coming from Dallas. I'm here to help out so-and-so. I don't want to cause any issues. You know, where do I sign in? What, what are your rules so that I can follow everything here? I want to be a guest. I want to make sure that this gets very comfortable so that you're going out of your way to introduce yourself and set them at ease that you want to follow the rules. You're not there just to be another rep that thinks that they own the world. You're there to help out their patient and their surgeon. And then you just want to get out of there so that you're not creating any issues in the OR. And that's just the nurse. Talking to the doctor is a completely different perspective. Yes. You got to walk in there. And I mean, it's your own stance. So like if I'm talking to the church nurses, I kind of like slouch a little. If I'm talking to the doctors, I got to open up my chest, kind of look a little taller. Yeah. Big, you, like those little things so that they can Posh, understand that. Posturing, man. That's insane. You're so next level. You've gone in our first 10, 20 minutes, you've gone Dalai Lama and you've gone posturing. That's why you're special and unique, Toby. Like literally those things matter. And, and, and it's not like you're bowing up. You're, you're just confident in your delivery to the surgeon and then when it's to the nurse or the scrub you're more a how can i help let's just get this let's get through this right mm -hmm. so okay let's let's expand that a little bit more in in that scenario where you have tons of experience of being a successful sales rep and spine and now you have to wear a different hat how have you managed not being the star and not running the room, but teaching others to, to do that. What are some things you've learned? So one, do the same thing with the rep. Talk to them like, hey, how many have you done? What are you looking to get out of this? Have you done to any of the trainings? How comfortable are you with the sets? Have you memorized the sets? Like, have you, have you looked at MRIs? Have you looked at CT scans? Have you looked at the bed setup? Do you know how to run the bed? Like these are all little questions that we've done that I don't think about anymore. However, those were all things that my old mentor, um, Joe Orledge, taught me. Joe. And he, yeah, he walked, I mean, this was my distributor. My boss was setting up sets with me, which is wild. I was going to ask you, can you talk about like, like how you started, but, but keep going. But I, I do want to hear, because we, we just completely so, skipped over that. I'm just so yeah. excited to talk. And so... I talk to those guys and I can see that they're, that they get really nervous. They're talking about vasculature and understanding the anatomy. The thing is, you know, the anatomy, like let, for that, for the, for the purposes of what we're talking about, we know the anatomy Right. You to get comfortable enough to understand when you say something, you're saying it because you've done the work. Yes. Right. Like you and I are, are athletes. We've done it. Like we practice so that when I'm in the OR, I don't, I'm not nervous because I've already done this. I've done the practice before. So lean on it. Hey, doc, this is what I saw. This is the plan. And one thing that I did with a couple of my other docs was I, if I had the chance to go to their uh, office, I would create a game plan, take a snapshot. Hey, doc, this is where I think I might be an issue. This is the sizing. This is the setup. This is what I have for backup. And I'd send an email. So you Love it. give them a plan that you came up with, and now you can have something to talk about. They'll like, have that. I disagree. Hey, did you miss this? Did I miss this? Now, now you're becoming of a conversation. You're, now you're a consultant, I guess. Yeah, but you're not selling them a screw. You're 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 partnering exactly. with them on a solution for their patients, and you know the whole thing. The whole thing. The clinic is such a great environment, and you got to be careful, right? Because you don't want to disrupt their workflow right. in that actual clinic, right? They they have patients to see. So one of the things that I learned early on is that I got to be careful when I visit when the doctor's actually there seeing patients, right? You can do that but you can't slow them down. And, you know, you know, some of my old, some of my old uh, customers, right. Dr. Harper, Dr. Rose, like, 
I would just come in and we would just start talking. And then the, the staff was like, Jay, we got these patients to see. And so quickly realized like, okay, it's not about us. It, it's it's yes. as fun <laughs> as it is to talk to Dr. Rose about his experience in Vietnam or whatever it is. I got to get out of there. I got to remove myself from that. But maybe come back and just be with the MA and yeah. look through the films. Like it's not just... Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that that's just a missing piece. Sometimes people think they're too busy or, or they have cases and I get it. But creating that time and carving out the time to go through the surgical plan, it is so important. And I think it unlocks things that, that you know, you can't even you know, imagine. The thing about that is everybody's right. We're all busy, especially as we're running around if your territory is wide. Like I had an hour and a half drive from two of my accounts my busiest surgeons and one of my other uh friends the guy who trained me eric he would say then get up earlier so if i had tons of sets to do i had tons of excellence or corpectomies or deformity i would get up at four do my trace from five to seven a.m nobody's bothering you nope. it is yep. quiet i can put my headphones in knock out the trace go to their office then do my sales calls or my cases and then set up for the next day. Yes, it is unfortunate, but man, those two and a half hours by yourself. Yes. Saved the entire day. Otherwise, I'm doing sets at seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. PM. Yeah. Just is killing you. It's so brilliant. Up enough 12 trays and did that. Oh, and I hated it. Don't yeah. I hated it. Until one day I was like, I need to love this. I need to love the pain. See, I, I was weird. I still am weird. I absolutely loved, it was cathartic and therapeutic for me to put trays back together, to see the little shadow in, on the in, inner of the tray where it outlines a cob and then mm -hmm. put that cob there. I don't know why, but something about it like just was pleasing to my brain. It, it, I, I'll never be able to explain it. And, you know, I miss it today. It's so weird. But dude, you mentioned Eric McCorkle. I, I actually trained with him. And my favorite thing about, you know, some of the sales trainings we went through and, and, and he was just not, you know, it, it, he, he kind of stood up and I don't know, he, he, he said something that I actually just recently used with Keith Graffinini. But Eric said, they don't pay me to spell. They pay me to sell and walks out. And I just was like, God, I want to follow that guy. I love that guy. Yeah. So um, all right, let's, let's dig into you, man. Like, so, so going back, like what made you want to get into medical sales in the first place? I didn't even know this job existed. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> no idea this job existed. I like my parents, I'm an, uh, yeah, I'm like a, not even first generation immigrant. And I wanted to do something that my dad was proud of. My mom was proud of. I wanted to wear a suit to work. That to me was the idea of success that my dad's a construction worker. So he was always like around dust. And I love the man to know. I mean, the guy would come to my college soccer games like with his construction get up. And Amazing. I would look over. So like that drove me to say, hey, I need to, I need to make that dream of his to see me in a suit a reality because him, that is success. To that, to my mom, that's success. So I need to give them that somehow, some way. So love it. College was thinking about going to be an attorney, and then uh, my best friend, who's also a rep, he, you know, was working at a hospital, just trying to figure out life. And he's like, "Hey, man, you seem like you have a personality. Do you want to interview? Like, do you want to come work with me?" And I was like, "I mean, yeah, I'll give it a shot." I go. This is for trauma. So this is wow. all. But he, this was with a company called Acumen out of Oregon. Yep. And he's like, hey, just give it a shot. Get the job. And I was like, hey, you're going to train with this other guy. And his name is John. And the first time I walked into an OR, I mean, everybody's hyperventilating. They're like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm 22. I think I'm a half idiot. Why, what am I doing here? Yeah. Why would anybody ever listen to what I have to say? And then from that point on, like feeling that kind of sticking back to being an athlete, like having to do playoffs, like going after championships, like feeling that stress, it doesn't stress me out. I used to think it was like, oh, stress, I'm going to lose, you know, something, I'm going to make a mistake because I'm panicking. But really, like, right. tell you that your body is, there's a thing in front of you that you have to step up to, and your body's priming itself for that, for that stress. So, right, it's a change of mentality of, oh, I'm scared, I'm going to panic, where in general, it's like your body is acutely yes. risk 
to anything you're seeing. So it was more of a change of, man, I can do this because I remember what this felt like. Just it's a different setting. And you were, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that we're both athletes and, and I'm grateful to be in the same discussion with you because I played soccer high school. I was on ODP for a little bit, but you played for the Chicago Fire. Don't just sugarcoat the fact that, you, I mean, you're, you got to the highest level in America for professional soccer. So like your experience of going after championships is a lot different than mine, you know, going after state titles, right, in high school. So it was, it's, it's you know, I don't want to say played full on because I got injured, but it was nice to practice and hang out with those guys. This was back with Zach Thornton, yep. uh, Michael Beasley, like those guys, like Chris Armas. Um, this is back in 1999, folks. All right. So I love it. Wasn't even really around that time. It was, it was tight, but I mean, I loved it that they used to play at the Sol at Soldier Field. Um, it was awesome. They used so, to university. So tell me about that. Cause you grew up in Chicago and one of the things that we connected on was the last dance, right? I it, growing up in Dallas, you know, the Mavericks were terrible, you know, back when I was a kid. And so we had the Cowboys for football, they were doing all right. And then the bulls and, you know, the, the, my boys call me a front runner for, you know, bandwagon teams and like, whatever I, I I'm not but I love the Bulls and who didn't in the nineties. So you getting to grow up and watch Air Jordan and, and then, and just be in Chicago. But then, so I want to talk about, if we have time, I want to talk about the Bulls like in their height, but did you truly get like just goosebumps when you're practicing and playing on soldier field as a kid from Chicago? Like, can you, can you, can you describe that feeling? I mean, it's, it's crazy because I, we were ball boys too for the, for the Chicago fire. Like when, when I was, so when I was on my travel team, one of our coaches, he was actually one of the uh, scouts for the fire. So he's like, Hey, we got this thing. You should come out and check it out. Like come and train. Well, we mm -hmm. went uh, up, we were up in Lake forest, like close mm -hmm. to all that's where they did their initial training and you start seeing all these guys like i've never seen so many soccer balls in my entire life <laughs> hundred soccer balls everywhere i mean there's cones everywhere there's soccer balls there's goalies like in a triangle i'm like so they literally put the goalies through gauntlets where they would put them in triangles and they would just rotate and you just had guys ripping shots at them just I'm making saves at all angles saves everywhere oh and then the balls are running all over the place other guys are like practicing like he's trying to hit each other and I'm like, what is, what training is this? I didn't, awesome. I was a child, I was 17. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Being there, I, I caught myself watching because I was like, oh, I'm actually supposed to train here. I'm not supposed to, I'm not a fan. Yeah. Fan thing. So seeing, being, I mean, like I said earlier, like, it's, I love that city. I grew up on the South side. Um, you know, like people say that they're from somewhere. I am that guy. I'm like, look, I grew up in Chicago. Somebody says that from there. I'm like, are you from Chicago? Are you from Arlington Heights? Yeah, you yeah, from? yeah. Come on. That's well, it's funny. funny. <laughs> Go ahead. No, it, it's funny because I, I just didn't realize how much I loved living there, even though I live here. Um, and we can talk about this. That I had that opportunity to go back, which was a really difficult choice to turn down. Yeah. And just see, like every time I go home, I see the skyline. I like all the smells, the tastes come back like this. It just does not go away. So, okay, two things and, and, and I want to talk about. So totally agree with you about the pride of Chicago. So I'm from Texas and I have Texan pride and you see it living here, Texas size on our beer bottles. We have Texas, you know, flags and all this stuff. We're proud. But I had a buddy, a good friend of mine in college, a fraternity brother of mine, who he introduced himself as Chicago Nick when he came 18 years old to SMU in Dallas. He's like, Chicago Nick. And I was like, who, who is this guy? Like, but I loved it because it's just the same thing that when I was traveling and backpacking around the world, I was big Tex. You know, that's what people call me, you know, just, yes. just being from Tex, Texas. And, and like it, it, you, you identify with where you're from because that's home. And so uh, for people, we got summer, summer's here and Chicago is probably one of the top places in the world to go during the summer for a Cubs game or whatever it is. Top three, if you could boil it down, if someone's going to Chicago, what do they need to eat? Like what's, what's, what's like the one thing, you know, what do they need to see? Right. It just, it just, just three things that you would say as a 
tour guide. I'm sure people will ask you like, hey, I'm going to Chicago. Where should I go? Uh, we went to that wonderful restaurant at NAS that, that was just outstanding. Maybe that's on the list. It didn't have to be three, but I just, it's just, I, what, what, what would what, you say? You know, Chicago can get expensive and you can make things as cheap or as expensive as you need. Go to the beaches, Oak Street Beach, North Avenue Beach, whichever. I just in the summer, it is amazing. There are parties going on. You can buy drinks. You can sit on the water. Like it's, it's stare at a skyline. I've never seen a city where you have legit real water, like a real lake. And then it goes straight into skyscrapers. Like there is no connection. Like there's one street, which is Lakeshore Drive. And then you can see the whole city. Ju you jump in the water, you look up and you're staring at buildings. It, does, it doesn't make sense. You can't do that in New York. You can't do that no. now. Uh, so anything on the like, North Avenue Beach, Oak Street Beach, and on North Avenue Beach, you can go to Lincoln Park Zoo, which is free. It's one of the only like two or three left in the in the U.S. You can literally walk through the zoo as you're going to the beach. That's amazing. Like you don't have to do anything else. Like, and these are all just simple free things that you can do. Right. And then go to Wrigleyville. Like even if the Cubs aren't playing, just the energy in the area, it's fantastic. Go check it out. Um, I will. I mean, the, the South Side's getting better. Like where the White Sox play, that whole area has been redone, um, and they get connected by the Red Line. So you can literally go from Cubs to White Sox in one train ride. Were you a White Sox fan? Being from the South Side, I'm a Cubs fan. You're a Cubs fan. No, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Is it so? It doesn't really then have the the different regional ties, or does it? Like, how do you? How does one identify with with being a a White Sox fan or a Cubs fan? Like, what's like the, the Sox, that. like the Sox, they play like back when it was Comiskey Park, not even like what I don't know what it's called now. Like it's guaranteed rate field or whatever, like they've gone through changes. Um, and I'm not bashing them. I get it. So it's just you're in the south side, like you're out, you're down by 31st Street. And then Wrigleyville is literally in the middle of a neighborhood. Right. Like there are houses that where people live at right next to you. So I never seen that before. So that's how they identify. The problem is like when I was a kid, I was watching Ryan Sandberg, Mark Grace, and I, they were going up against Frank Thomas and Blackjack McDowell. Right. When I heard Blackjack McDowell, I was like, this guy sounds like he smokes cigarettes. Without right. <laughs> right. What's crazy about this, Toby, we're very close in age. And I remember those times too, because and I've talked about this before. There's so many Cubs fans, just like there's Braves fans, because WGN would would dis, would show the Cubs and TBS would show the Braves. So there's a lot of Cubs fans and Braves fans, even in Texas, right? Again, it's it's just a, an interesting, um, it's an interesting, I guess, social uh, just view to look and see like what you what you watched as a kid kind of dictates a lot about you know maybe your 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 who you follow. And even yeah. a step further, this is a random tangent, but I'm going to bring it up because that's what I do. When I was traveling and I had an opportunity to travel around the world and backpack, you know, kind of between careers, I, I did a gap year. Highly recommend that to any, anyone that's young, that's trying to figure out what they're going to do. Just go travel. It'll tell you about yourself, which is ultimately the most important thing to learn that perspective. I met some Norwegians. My, my best friend and I traveled with these two Norwegian girls and they sounded American. And I had no idea that they were even from a different country until they, until, until they started talking, Nurkin and the Kirkin, you know, <laughs> you know, or whatever they were saying. And I looked at them, I'm like, what, what is happening? And I asked them, how do you not have an accent? And you know what they said? They grew up watching American television, Saved by the Bell, whatever it was. They grew up with our culture. And so they emulated, they were able to talk just like we talk based on what they were watching. It's so crazy to me. And, and maybe there's someone that will watch this episode that can talk to us about this. My sister and I grew up in the same home. We went to the same schools. She has a heavy Texas accent, I don't. And I think that during her kinder or first grade year, formulative stuff, she had a very heavy accented, a, a teacher with a very deep Southern Texas accent. And I didn't. And I think that that's, as you, as you think about the brain and how we learn, maybe that's it, right? Maybe these Norwegian girls that, that were watching TV, like they learned to speak English when they were practicing English 
They learn to speak just like you and I. And, and so similarly to the Cubs or the Braves, allegiance to those teams, when you're young and you're watching these teams like, uh, you know, Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin and, 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 and them winning or Ryan Sandberg, as you said, I loved him just from watching him as a kid. Just, and just seeing the excitement. I mean, that was back when right, it's a two TV. I don't think people understand that. Mm-hmm. God, we sound old. I swear to God, we're not. I mean, we're not that old, right? We're not that old. <laughs> but these little tube TVs and you're glued to it. And, and Harry Carey is oh. like, I don't know, probably like six drinks deep, which yeah. I had idea as a child that the man was probably half drunk. And I loved hearing his voice. He was excited. Uh, I do the same thing with the, with the size. I mean, Frank Thomas is one of my favorites. Um, but I mean, Robbie Ventura getting rocked in the, getting into a fight with, with uh, Nolan Ryan. Ryan. Oh my God. You know, I, you remember this. I remember that so well. And Nolan was, I loved Nolan Ryan, right? That was kind of started when he started, when he signed with the Rangers and started just crushing no hitters. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's just absolutely uh, mind boggling to me. Um, that, but but that moment, the moment of when Robin Ventura, for those that don't know this iconic moment in history, Robin Ventura charges the mound. And Nolan Ryan was probably twice his age at the time. He's probably 40 something years old, right? He, he was like akin to Tom Brady today, just an older man for his sport, but still crushing it, still at a high level. And he gets Ventura in a headlock and starts hitting him in the head. It's such a, I mean, it's a, that's a picture that I would love to display in my office if I could convince yeah. my wife. Yeah, I don't think she remembers that moment. So. And the thing is, like, he's the first guy I thought of, like, wow, that's Texas strong. Like, what? that's like old man strength. What is that? Old man like, Texas strength. Yeah. Like, like, does he, like, go home in cowboy boots? Like, I don't know how that guy passes. I mean, Dude, that's what he does. The ticket in Dallas, Sports Radio 1310, the ticket, giving them a shout out, not that they need it. They're probably one of the most listened to, downloaded um, sports radio uh, stations in the world. But I stream them still, and I listen to some of the Dallas uh, sports stuff because I'm a huge Mavs fan. We're up 2-0 on the Clippers, by the way. Incredible. Luka Doncic, unreal. I was at Dirk's last final game in San Antonio with my good friend Joe just a big Mavs fan, Cowboys fan, Stars fan. But the ticket does fake Jerry Jones, fake Nolan Ryan. And it is this guy that does it named Gordon Keith. It's absolutely hilarious because he has this, Toby, you've got to listen to it. I, I will I'll send you maybe a few episodes. The fake Nolan Ryan just, just, just talks about like snow monkeys and he's got to go fight. It's nothing about baseball. It's like turned into this like almost like a Saturday night live skit, but better because it builds. And every time he's on, he talks about fighting the snow monkeys in his yard and, and just, just making jerky and doing all this crazy stuff. It's hilarious. And he's a character. He Nolan Ryan, man. He's I definitely want to check that out. What's funny is I sent you all these questions that we're going to talk about. And here we are. And I don't even know if we've, we maybe talked about what, but this, okay. this is good. I mean, this is, I mean, people are like, why are you doing a podcast? Well, I was a guest on two shows and I'm like, man, this is really fun. I've always kind of thought about it. And so we're just going to do it. And this has been, I don't know about, I don't know. I'm having a great time. Okay. So let's, let's ask a couple of questions, uh, twofold uh, advice that you would give someone trying to get into this industry. We'll start there. Oof. Um, you know what the the hardest part is you're probably going to feel like you're behind the eight ball. You're always going to think like, I need to know all this anatomy, all these things, all the, like how to sell and how to run trades, how to manage your time. Like, and it comes at you on day one. It is not like day 20 or, you know, month nine. The biggest piece of advice is go and ask to be taught, be a student again. I mean, if, especially if you're young, if there's nothing wrong with telling the surgeon, Hey, I'm getting into this business. I'm very interested if you're lucky enough that a couple of guys or, or uh, now amazing young women will tell you, hey, can, I, can you teach me this? Like, I'm curious. I read this article. I don't really understand it. Can you walk me through it? If you have four or five minutes, like, what does that look like? Just asking. Most surgeons that I have met are natural teachers or they've yes. done the, the teaching. And in Miami, I was with Dr. Thomas and I've asked him, like, why, why do you do this? First of all, I love that man. 
Um, Adrian Thomas is an, he's just an incredible human being, surgeon. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so, so is Raj, Dr. Raj Paul in um, oh, Denver. Amazing. Special, human. special, and, special, special humans. Yeah. So like one, they're amazing guys for their community. They do great things. But he told me, I'm like, you know why I love doing this? I have two or three residents. Some of them are PGY4. Some of them are fellows. I love in their face when they finally get the aha moment. That's what I like. So awesome. it was the same thing, like now training CSAs or, or training some of my colleagues. I like seeing the aha moment in them. Like, I just didn't know how to put it together. And he literally told me how it's done. So if you're trying to get in, ask a lot of questions. That's the hardest part for us is we are supposed to know everything, which I don't know whoever said that. I don't know how that ever was told, but ask that you don't know. Saying you don't know is a good thing. They've been yes. trained for years. You and, haven't done anything. And every day, I just posted this earlier this morning on LinkedIn. Every single day is an opportunity to improve yourself and those people in the lives of people around you. And so every day you need to commit to doing something that moves the ball, right? Toby, you came into uh, Medtronic with a ton of lateral experience, ton of you know trauma experience, but probably not a lot of navigation and robotics. And now what, three plus years later, you're one of the best. And so you had to commit to learning new skills, even as a veteran in the industry, which I commend you for. And so what would you say? Okay, so that's good advice, big time. What about like, where do you see your career? We've got we've got about 10 minutes or so left. Where do you see your career going? Where do you where do you want it to go? Right? What what what, what are your thoughts? I didn't realize like how much I like being a teacher and helping. I mean, I went to Colombia. you know, you've done Africa, um, life changing events. Once I saw that I was blown away. Like, I, I give up two weeks of my year, specific, no matter if I ever get out of the business, I still want to work with, um, with the NGO, with Dr. Ranella out in Chicago, what they do is amazing. Just like Dr. Harper did for Florida or for uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. Same, similar to Florida. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you know, I mean, it depends on which part of Florida. That's yeah. darn sure. We were just there. No, I'm just we were just there. Yeah. Um, so, like, how, like, where I see myself is I'm trying to get to the next level being on director side, but overall, like, the idea to have a strategy and direct a whole spine team, that's where I like to be. And it doesn't have to be like just in a district manner. Um, there's a position that I'm going after in that sense. But I would like to do it more on either regional or a, or a national scale, because what you and I've had when we travel is I've seen what happens in California, what's happening in Texas, what they're doing in Colorado, what they're doing in New York, Chicago, Florida. Yep. And there's a there's a disconnect based on their training, which makes sense. But how can that be standardized so that if you are a surgeon in L.A. and you go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, you should get the same care, especially yep. within the same skill set that the surgeons have. That's awesome, man. And, and, and I might be biased because I've always been a fan of yours. Uh, biased for Tobias. <laughs> Dad jokes. Dad jokes. <laughs> they, they, they come in my brain and I just, I, I can't not say them sometimes. My wife is just like, I, I'm glad she didn't hear that. <laughs> I might repeat it to her later. I'm biased for Tobias. Um, I'm going to keep saying it. But I think that you're ready for management and leadership. And the reason why is exactly what you just went to. You're, you're ready to teach. You, you've been teaching others. You've been showing them, you know, how to do what you do, right? And what you do makes you special. Your skill set is what makes you special. But the bigger impact that you could have, just like you just trained a ton of residents and fellows and early surgeons, you, uh, along with our, our wonderful faculty, train them in the latest and greatest techniques. You can do that same thing to a sales force and a sales team that will allow bigger for bigger impact because it, it, it's something you can do at scale, right? And, and that's why I think it, I, I've been a leader. Uh, I guess I consider, even though I don't have direct reports, I consider myself still in sales leadership um, be, because of the reach and the voice that we have and the impact, the potential impact that we can have um, working with those surgeons, being an extension of their team. You, know, you mentioned Raj Paul, right? He's in Denver. I'm in Texas. We're still very much in communication. We text all the time, right? He, Roy and the team, uh, awesome. And, and, and he, he, 
really has a good thing going in his terms of his practice in Boulder. But, you know, how can we take pieces of that to your point? How can we take what he's figured out about robotics, about navigation, and teach others the same way? And, and, and everyone's going to approach it a little bit differently. And that's good. It's good to have very, uh, uh, some variety in terms of how surgeons treat patients. I mean, that's just going to happen based on their natural God-given ability based on their training. But what you're talking about is how can we standardize technology? How can we standardize our workflows at, to help those surgeons and the sales reps mm -hmm. and other people that, 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 that touch this industry um, to understand that value? I want to add two things that two books that I've read that changed everything. And it's funny, I was talking to Andre about this and we shared mm -hmm. each other. Nice. Uh, first one, it's called- Andre Lede, by the way, yeah. vice president of the Texas, Oklahoma region, mm -hmm. uh, exceptional guy. He's been in the business for a while. Mm -hmm. What's and, up, Andre? And, and the first one is called Man's Search for Meaning by Victor- yes. Frankel. I quoted Another. him the other day about, about yeah. the response. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So read it. It's a dense book, but it's thin. Just a lot to take. It takes a second. I had to read it two or three times. There's some really graphic stories in there and yeah. teaches you how to respond to those. And then the other one is called uh, Peak Performance by Anders Anderson. And he literally goes like how to become great at anything. Literally. That's awesome at anything there's also there's a podcast about him as well it's, it takes an hour to listen to i think it's pot, like episode 243 um don't quote me on that but just google him yeah. and you'll fear so one literally teaches you how to deal with adversity how to not get bogged down and in the same process how to get good at it and i love that two together trust me like you'll find a way to connect whether it's you were a ballerina a violinist uh, a sports guy like the process is very similar. Mm -hmm. Don't just push them up to the side. So reading is I read more. I have book reports on books I read now. Stuff that I was doing when I was in fifth grade that I hated doing. Yeah. I can become a child. Same. It, it's for school because if I have a bad day and my book report, it's an eight, 10 minute read. I can read it in 10 minutes and it centers you again. Like do those little things for you that like eight, 10, 15 minutes it doesn't take very long. You think it doesn't. I mean, how many times have people sat on the toilet for more than 10 minutes? That's Just right, brother. That's right. Now we went there. We went from Dalai Lama farting to, the, to reading <laughs> on the toilet. But I'll tell you, I'd say, hey, no, you're 100% you're right. I used to not read. I used to waste a ton of time. Right? How much time have, I, have we all wasted in our lives? And if you realize that life is precious, the time is short, right? Yes. And that we're here to make an impact and to improve lives of others, uh, that, that reading is going to become more and more, uh, and, and maybe for those of you that watch this, you've already figured this thing out, but I don't watch television. I really don't. Unless it's live sports, I don't watch television. Now, movies, love movies. Ted Lasso is pretty much a movie that's cut up into series, so Ted Lasso gets a, gets a pass, Breaking Bad, Seinfeld, those are my, those are my shows. And so I, there's some exceptions to the rule. But yes. what I'm saying is that I don't just sit down and blindly turn on the TV anymore. When I've got an hour, I'm going into family first, then in, improvement and reading and, and just, just absorbing information second. And so Viktor Frankl and Anders Anderson, right, these people have so much value that they're that they put out in their in terms of their books and that's why you're special toby because yes you've been extremely successful in your career in med device and yes you're uh, a light and you're a value valued member of my team and and of any team but you're also improving every day and that's that's the difference you, you i'm never and i don't think you are ever going to be like i've made it I'm good. I'm here. Kick the feet up. Like, let's do this. Like, tell me how great I am. Look at the trophies on the wall. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, that's no. the. That's now, just we might be good at the same thing we've done over and over and over again. But look at what we started. Look at what we're doing with with our previous employers, Nuvasive, which 
You know, I thought that with that, I, they were a big part of my life. I will never say anything negative. Same. Um, like Pat Miles, it was a great guy. Um, yeah. He sent me a video on, I think I shared that with you on how to make meaning in your company. But you, it's like just meaning and on anything. And, and that these are things that people have done. What they did for me was they lessened the curve of how fast I can learn because it took them, let's say five right. years. They shortened it to a year for me. So it's unbelievable. For me, it's incumbent up on me to share it with the next crop. So maybe their learning curve is only six months. You get better because other people before you did all the work. That's work right. I'm going to do. And they're visionary, right? And you mentioned Pat Miles. I'm glad you did. Pat's had a huge impact on my life. Mm -hmm. um, he was a visionary leader at Nuvasive. He's doing the same thing today for Alpha Tech. And I remember when I left Nuvasive and I turned in my letter of resignation, who do you think was the one executive that reached out to me in, in a sincere way? Pat Miles. Never forget that. It, still have that still yeah. have that email i would still call him a friend uh we probably don't talk as much because he's running a company you know all <laughs> things a competitor uh, of ours right yeah. so a competitor like, of ours yeah like keep, keep your keep your friends close keep your competitors you know yeah like but that's one of those things that you in this in this business it's really weird it's it's way too small a lot like you can come from i mean for christ's sake, you you were in austin i was in valparaiso northwest indiana south chicago area like somehow we connected, but now we're connecting to these huge, I mean, for Christ's sakes, like we have access to Larry Lenke. Yeah. Like what, like what, what, like what happened? Or we can have access to guys that are doing like, like crazy spine cases or robotic cases, Dr. Poulter in Indianapolis. I'm um, going to see him very yeah. soon. I can't wait. Dude, he's a fantastic guy. Say hi to Tommy. He's one of my boys. Tommy's the best. Tommy's uh, Dr. Ashgar in Florida doing prolaterals. I mean, yep. so many guys that we, we can throw names. Even when I see Dr. Uribe, like he remembers me or somewhat because I was one of the few guys that spoke Spanish and I would just like ask him questions in Spanish. And then he kind of like, look at me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So like little things like that. Like you and, and guys, if you don't know who these guys are, this is just people that we feel like they're leaders in their field. Right. Amazing, amazing things in the OR. So Google those guys. Like you'd be amazed what you can find on Google now. And they're, they're starting to, they're starting to post things. I love this. You know, I, I'm not going to take credit for anything that, that the Dr. Raj Paul does, but, but I, I was can, trying to get him to join LinkedIn and cause he's big on Instagram, but, but like LinkedIn, right. is such a, uh, you know, my thoughts on this platform. It's a, it's an incredible vehicle and yeah, your is posting stuff all the time, right. Uh, Asgard does a great job of that, right. They're passionate about what they do. And they're very good at their niche and exactly what they're doing. And so why wouldn't they be, be just openly sharing the, the, the things that, that have made them successful, right? I, in, a, in a much different way, I do the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, Don Blaskowitz, right? So Don and I connected uh, a while ago, right? And, and just recently was texting with him just the other day. And so he's going to come on the podcast and on the show. And I'm really excited to, to talk with him because he's, he's seen a lot of, of kind of what you're talking about, like the, the, the philanthropy efforts in different countries for mission work, um, complex spine surgery and kind of where it's, where it's going. And this is, I think, the best thing about what we get to do, Toby. You mentioned Dr. Lenke. And it, it, people like Dr. Lenke, Dr. Kabuli, right? Dr. Lehman. These, these, these surgeons that we get to work with, Dr. Caballo, they're doing such amazing work for their own communities. And if we can be a megaphone and a beacon for them to other spine surgeons, like uh, at the Future Spine Leaders course that we just, we just wrapped up, then, then that's awesome because then ultimately we're, we're impacting a patient somewhere along the way that, 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 that is, it's just going to deliver value. And I mean, and we could throw names everywhere. Like there's Dr. Hotchkiss in Dallas, who's one of my favorite guys. Yep. Uh, Dr. Pham at UCSD, another wonderful human being. Absolutely. Dr. Like, Pham is amazing. I, I, yeah, so we, we, I, the reason we throw these names and for people to listen to them, it's I used to hide my secrets because I wanted success and yes. I don't competition. However, my old boss would also, and again, boss, uh, mentor would say like, we're teaching our competition but you still got to come at me. You still got to execute. Look, I will my plate, but I, odds are you might not do the work. 
Think about Gary V. He shares everything, right? And 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 if you think about it, like, look, I'm not sharing anything that you guys can't figure out on your own from a sales book or a movie. I'm packaging it in a different way. The, the, a lot of people are like, oh, man, these are trade secrets, right? Wearing scrubs to sales calls. I'm like, come on, come on, man. Like there's, for me, there's so much like, oh, it's difficult to break into the medical sales industry. No, it's not. It's not. And I'm empowering people to, to, to figure it out what it is inside of us that makes, and I'm, 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 I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting it. Yeah, Sorry, man. brother. What is it inside of us that makes us unique and different? I don't know, but I am excited and, and, and so passionate about what I do because at the end of the day, in, you know, in, in, however we get there, we are helping to improve spine surgery and we're helping that patient on the table. And someday that patient's going to be someone that I love and someone that I know. And it's been that person before, right? And so if I can just move things and improve things every single day, eventually, right? Cream rises to the top. Surgeons are going to improve the way they treat patients and outcomes are going to get better. And then everybody wins. So for me, sharing secrets, I just want people to be better. I want the sales reps to be better. I want the sales leaderships to be better. And then one day, if and when I'm running a company or if and when I'm VP of sales, like that, that it's going to be all the things that I talked about. I'm going to do those same things on a much larger platform. So, and, and don't be afraid to do the little bitty work that everybody hates. And I was, I was planning on my interview and I was like trying to practice. I legit put myself back and did a mock interview. I have beautiful. I, I, and you're like, Oh, why would you do that? That's so weird. Like, I don't want to role play. You're not role playing. You're, you're not a mindset. You're, you're, you're switching your body to tell you that hey, you time to step up to something that's new and something that's uncomfortable for you. Yeah. New basic training, right? I've yeah. I told this story before, but I've never gone public with it. I failed my X lift certification. I had to fly home. The reason I knew everything, I had it all memorized. I had never rehearsed how to talk through a surgeon. And, you know, some of the sales education people at that time uh, was just like, they were just pretending like they didn't know how to hold a cob and just like not giving you any pointers. And so if you hadn't practiced and rehearsed how to talk someone out of trouble, then you, you, it doesn't matter if you know the information. If you can't vocalize it, what, okay. what do you do? I, I went back, I rehearsed, I talked to anyone that I could, my wife, my friends, my, my colleagues. I came back and I didn't miss one question. Like I got a hundred on, you know, a hundred percent. And then, so it's like, that's the lesson that I learned. And to your point, rehearsing is everything. Practice your pitch. Like Alan Iverson said, like talking about practice. Yes, I'm talking, we're talking about practice. Like you play, and this is what I teach my boys. You play the way you practice. Mm -hmm. Practice is when you figure out the kinks so that when you're in the game, when you're playing that soccer game, you've already gotten to the point where you know, and you've, you've, you've kind of visualized it, right? You've practiced mm -hmm. it so many times. Repetition, then it's muscle memory. And then you do it when it matters the most. It's, there's, a, there's a difference between knowing and doing. And I was Dr. Amen. Tompkins, who, who you've met. Dr. We, Tompkins. A man. It. Love it. I was, he was doing a case. I've done, him and I've done God knows how many cases. And I was, I had the text like rolling to the point that Dr. Tompkins like one day just looks up at me and goes, I bet you you can do this surgery, can't you? And to me, I, that was like yeah. probably like the pinnacle of my career that a surgery. Oh my gosh. Something is probably half serious. And then I looked at him and I was like, no, the difference is I know what you do. I just don't. Yeah. Do and then I am, he goes, I agree. That makes sense. My, my computer, I, for some reason, I didn't plug this thing in overnight. There you go. Prior planning, right? I talk about it. I need to listen to myself. So we're about to, I'm about to lose power. So before we do that, I'm going to close out. Toby, this is great. I, I thank you so much for carving out time in your day. I know you're super busy. I know you're about to leave uh, again to get on another airplane. Thank you for, for sitting down with us on Sultans of Spine podcast. Again, I don't know where this thing's going to go, but but early signs are good. And, and, and every single conversation that I've had, just like this one, I learned something. And so if I'm learning something, then maybe the audience will learn something too. And we're going to keep it going. So any parting words, anything you'd like to say to, to your fans? Where, where can people find you if they want to learn more about Tobias? Um, 
just LinkedIn is probably the easiest way because everything else I try to keep private. Um, there's things in life that you just, you should keep to yourself. Uh, but parting words, there is nothing like hard work. And by that, I'm not talking work in sense like go mow your lawn, go do some physical labor, like get a callus in your hand. Yeah. Like, nothing, ever, nothing has to be pretty. Like you don't just read all day, go practice what you read. And I would, the one thing I would tell you, if you read one of those books, Use it as a social experiment. Use it on your parents. Use it That's on your, right. your boyfriend just to see if it works. Just try it out. It feels manipulative. And I, I get that people might see that side, but just see if what you read. Yeah. Put it in practice. Put it in practice. You see you what know, works. Forrest Gump famously said, <laughs> you can tell a lot about someone by them shoes, where they're <laughs> going, where they've been. Damn. I've worn lots of shoes, you know, <laughs> and he's kind of like calluses, right? Like it, yeah. you can tell a lot about someone based on just how they carry themselves and, and, and the experiences are everything. The calluses mm -hmm. of our, of our lives in our brains and our bodies, like we've gone through the, the ringer, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. uh, man, that's such a great point. You've got so much knowledge, so much wisdom. Thanks for sharing it. Love you, bro. And let's, let's do this again. Yes, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. This was way more fun. Dude, I could do this for another two hours. All day, baby. Tune in next week. We're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna bring these episodes every week. If you're a spine surgeon out there or someone that touches this industry, reach out to me. I'd love to, to talk to you about your story, your path, and your why. Jay, question for you. Would we ever bring in a administrator? Absolutely. I would love to. Sorry to, to add a little extra on there. Don't don't ever apologize for being great, for being awesome. <laughs> you know, what is that? Uh, Vince Vaughn and in, yeah. in, in old school, you know, you know, apologies for what? Being awesome? Give them a high five. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, have a great weekend. I can't wait to, 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 to see you live and in person again. Uh, I'm biased for Tobias. And uh, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy your day, brother. Thanks. I have a good one. See you, man. Bye.